So what I want to do today is to talk about um, the relationship between uh, autocrats and their own particular versions of history. And I give you two in front of you, one on the left is no introduction and one on the right I'll talk more about uh, the Emperor Augustus uh, because I'm a Roman historian. But I wanted to begin with, um, hang on, to begin uh, with um, a publication produced by, or at least over the name of Vladimir Putin on the 12th of July in 2021, an article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And this is a 5,000 word essay published on the internet in Russian, also translated into Ukrainian uh, and in English, the version I read. And it presents a view of the past, um, which is extremely tendentious, it claims that Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians are essentially the same people, united by a common histories at the time of the ancient Rus. Um, that they are, have a common religious, uh, spiritual identity, bonds of kinship, and that uh, the divisions between the nations at the moment are the results of uh, tragic historical mistakes, and particularly the divisive policy of enemies, of common enemies, and occasionally sustained by selfish elites in the countries against the interests and wishes of the Russian peoples who live in all three of them. And this propagandistic um, account um, is um, an example I want to keep in our mind when looking at the similarly selective and self-interested account of his reign by the first Roman emperor, the Emperor Augustus, that goes under the title, the raised gestae, the deeds achieved, the achievements of the deified Augustus, because it is published um, after his death, by which time rapidly, although with a lot of foreplanning, he had become a god. So what do we know about these raised gestae? Well, here's Augustus's life laid out for you. Um, that he, he changes his name and changes his brand several times. He's born as Gaius Octavius. He's adopted in the will of Julius Caesar after his Julius Caesar assassination and takes on the name Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. For a period we call the Triumvirate because it's divided between three different, different men trying to be Caesar's heir. Um, he is one of three tresviri. Um, and then he defeats the last of these, Antony, with Cleopatra in 31 at the Battle of Actium, and then reigns for 45 years as the autocrat in Rome. And the document we see is written right at the end of that period. So we're looking at Augustus, again, giving an account of the past, uh, which is highly interested to himself. Here is the easiest way to look at the text now. It's a great... Um, uh, inscription put up uh, by Mussolini. Uh, when Mussolini found the altar of peace, dug it up, had it transplanted to the banks of the Tiber, reassembled in a purpose-built museum on one side of a square that was built um, around uh, the tomb of Augustus. So we're seeing a monument to fascist architecture. So another, a second dictatorship here, the dictatorship of Mussolini, um, putting as part of the monuments and symbols around the tomb of Augustus, um, the actual art altar of peace and a copy of the text, um, in La the Latin text of Augustus's account of his own life, which begins, you see the raised gestae divi Augusti, um, Quibus Orbem Terrarum Imperio Populi, and it's longer than that, but I couldn't find an, Im an image that showed the whole of it and still gave any sense at all of the text. Now, Theodore Monson called this the queen of inscriptions, I think, because it's so enormous and enormous importance. And the, the heading, which is picked out there in Latin, and I put in bold capitals here, um, was that was also in different font, as it were. That's also a larger size on the actual monuments that we've got. So we can treat it as a genuine monument, as a genuine title, if you like, to this enormous inscription. And the title is about how one man, Augustus, now a god, 
made the entire world, the Orbis Terrarum, the entire world subject to the power of the Roman people. So this is the theme he wants to present, that he has created a moment where Rome, the Roman people achieve their historic destiny. So this is, again, rather like that historic unity um, that um, Putin refers to in his 5,000 word article. And then what Augustus goes on to do, or what the inscription goes on, just provide 35 chapters written in the first person. I did this, I did that, it was done to me, which listed his honours, the gifts he made, the buildings he built, the festivals he celebrated, his military achievements, his political achievements, and bound up in this, a highly selective and interested account of his own career. Now we know a bit about this text because it's mentioned in the, in the longest biography we have of Augustus. We've got several written accounts of Augustus' reign at the historian Cassius Dio. There's um, a lost um, version as well, which is by Nicolaus of Damascus, which feeds into many of the versions. Um, but Suetonius, who's writing in the early second century, so looking back for more than a century, to the life of Augustus, describes in the last chapter um, what Augustus leaves behind. And he, just, he leaves behind his will. Um, he leaves behind, and alongside the will, um, he leaves three documents. And the documents, the codicils it's called here, um, are then described down at the bottom. I've skipped the passage where it details his will and who his heirs were. His main heir was his, um, was his stepson, Tiberius, who became the next emperor. So here, the will originally on two, sheets, two skins of parchment, put in the custody of important priestesses, the Vestal Virgins, read out to the Senate, it's a highly public statement. And then what are the three appendices, what are the three codices of the will? One of them is orders for his funeral. So he has planned his funeral, including presumably the moment at which a cage is on top of the funeral pyre, is broken open, and an eagle, presumably terrified by the flames, zooms up to heaven and is declared to be carrying the soul of the emperor to the gods. And then there's also the bottom, the last one is an account of, of who's in the empire, where the monies are, is who the troops are. Um, the revenue, and, and with the significant detail that the only people who know the details are Augustus's own slaves and ex-slaves, that he's been running the whole empire for these last 45 years through his personal household. But in the middle, a summary of his acts, which he intended should be inscribed on brazen plates, brass columns, and put in front of his mausoleum. So what we read here is a deliberate account which he has already decided how it will be displayed. It will be displayed beside his tomb, his mausoleum, in the center of Rome. So we're seeing a letter in a bottle. This is how he wants to be remembered. What we have is not those bronze tablets, but we have copies of the text that was on them, including a Greek version. And the longest one comes from the Temple of Roman Augustus in the Roman city of Ankara, modern Ankara, in the center of Turkey, and but we have fragments of others. So we know that this document was inscribed in other cities too, including Pisidian Antioch and Apollonia, or both of them in the same province of Galatia. And perhaps there are bronze versions elsewhere, which were melted down, it's the stone ones, of course, which survive. And you can see, I hope, the scale of it. This is an enormous inscription and in the temple of Roma to Augustus, it's, you see it on either side as you go in through the entrance. Half of it, chapters 1 to 13 on one side, and the other half on the other. And most people think that, it, it, that this division in the two halves reflects the division onto the two brass columns that were set up outside the mausoleum, according to the terms of Augustus's will. And here is the heading from um, Ankara. And I've taken this uh, from the work of Alison Cooley, and much of this depends on her important work. Um, and you can see there again, picked out in large, large font, as it were, at the top, um, the introduction that I mentioned, but it adds to it. Um, oh, in this case, it adds also the expenses he incurred, so how much he spent 
on the Roman state, how much he spent on the people of Rome, as inscribed upon two bronze columns which have been set up at Rome. And you can see uh, here is the exempt word exemplar. So this is the copy. So this is declares itself to be a secondary document. This is a copy of the, and the primary document is still thought to be the one in Rome. So it's displayed to the provincials for their, their view in Greek, their own language, but also in Latin, the language of empire. And in some places like Antioch in Pisidia, it's a Roman colony, probably the language of many of the colonists at the time. Here's the mausoleum of Augustus. Um, as it is today, just recently reopened, in fact, to, uh, to visitors. Um, and here you see around it, you'll see um, the Mussolini square. So, and he's laid out a square, which wasn't an original one. And you can't see all of it, but it has huge fascist reliefs. Tell us more about Mussolini's idea about his new Rome. Um, but also here is the the box, if you like, which had has the into which the altar of peace was moved by Mussolini, and here is the Arapakis. So uh, here is the inscription. So that so the text of the of the raised guest is reunited with the monument. And originally, outside the monument, probably here were the two bronze columns, long disappeared, of course, and inside the monument. Uh, the tomb of Augustus, and this is a reconstruction of how it may have looked. It was we know it was set in a in a huge park on the campus, Marcius, what's now the Centro Storico, the city of Rome. Um, so it was open to the public to wander around and admire the tomb of Augustus. And on top of the tomb is a great bronze statue of the man himself. So you have the bronze columns, the bronze statues. So here it's got the, this is the this is where this reconstruction thinks the bronze columns are. Um, the bronze statue, and then a column with a, with a dome sitting on top of the huge base. We see the base here, and that would have been the basis for the other stuff. And um, we have one eyewitness account, and this is the eyewitness account from uh, a Greek from Asia Minor, Strabo, um, and he just and he's uh, he visited Rome, so he and he gives, if you like, a non-Roman view of this, and he describes how. Um, how beautiful the campus masters is, and this comes as part of it. He says, most noteworthy, the mausoleum, a great mound near the river, a lofty foundation of white marble covered in, in conifers, and on top the bronze image of Augustus Caesar. And beneath the mound is his own tomb and the tomb of his friends and his relatives. And then the great sacred precinct with wonderful promenades. And, uh, and then there's also... It, nearby is a wall around the spot at which his, uh, his cremation took place, where that funeral for which he provided instructions along with his will was performed. So you see a permanent monument to a temporary performance, Augustus becoming a god, and all the evidence laid out there for the people of Rome to see, and around the wall black poplars to, show, to do with the sign of the dead. And this is the culmination of Strabo's account of how spectacular and beautiful Rome is in Augustus's day, or rather in the time of, of Tiberius immediately afterwards when Strabo visited. Now in terms of the context, we're seeing a propaganda version of Augustus, but we're seeing the last version of many versions of Augustus, because in the length of time from the death of from Caesar's murder to the death of Augustus. So we're looking at a span of um, you know, nearly 60 years. Augustus, Octavian, had to change his image many times uh, to begin with, uh, trying to present himself as more Caesarian than anybody else, later trying to represent himself as not quite as vicious as his acts had showed himself in the Triumvul period. Then a lot of the middle period propaganda is forgets Antony and forgets all of that. And it's all about the future and dynasty and the people he hopes will succeed him, his grandsons who die before he does, and enter the mausoleum and others as well, his son-in-law Marcellus. And by the end of it, we've got the last version of Augustus. So had he died at other first, we have a different version. So Augustus throughout his reign is constantly remaking his image. And I suppose that would be true too of Vladimir Putin. Had we seen his views um, written before 1989, they would perhaps have looked very different to the way they do today. Now, Helen Roche talked on Monday about uh, the tools of propaganda used 
um, by the Nazi regime. Um, and I wanted to re recall this because um, we're, we're used thinking about how propaganda is conveyed to the tools, particularly of the 20th century. Uh, in terms of the website, of course, um, I started with it's the 21st century. But here you have on the left, the first edition of Pravda, and on the right, a Russian school book. So a textbook rather like the, uh, with a similar sort of propagandistic intents uh, to the kind of textbooks that Helen talked about being given to school children um, during the, the early years of the Third Reich. But of course, the ancient world doesn't have access to print journalism. And so when we look at propaganda in antiquity, it, we have to think of it in rather different terms. That doesn't mean it isn't useful. In fact, this book by Paul Zanka, uh, The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus, was strongly informed uh, by the experience of Germany under National Socialism. And Zanka, uh, writing as professor at the time in Munich, uh, surrounded by fascist monuments of his own, own country, was extremely aware of how monuments and images had been used uh, by Hitler, um, using a classical idiom and a classicizing idiom uh, to bolster the Third Reich. Um, but we do need to think about differences in technology when thinking about the way in which propaganda was conveyed in the ancient world. If we think about the modern world, just to go back, to remind us how modern all these things are. The internet celebrates its birthday apparently on 1983. Uh, this is the point where different networks of computers were connected up to begin that process that has led to the growth of the World Wide Web. Though as a lecturer in Oxford, I don't think I was actually able to get got the internet in my office until about 1996, which tells you some, something about the slowness of the growth of the world internet, but also something about the extent to which Oxford in the time embraced um, electronic communications. If we think about television propaganda, well, this really starts only in the 50s, although there's technologies around in the 30s. In Britain, we like to say the big boom in television came after the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. There was a radio cut, the first national radio station in the 1920s. And we go back to the point at which the British Empire began to be connected instantaneously uh, by telegraphs, goes back to the Victorian period, the late Victorian period. Um, so the, the story that, um, that uh, Charles Napier, when he conquered the Indian province of Sin, sent a one word telegraph message back in Latin is unfortunately a modern myth. He said peccavi, Latin for I have sinned. In terms of print journalism, the first newspapers in Europe in the 17th century, and this has been linked by Benedict Anderson and others with the creation of national consciousness. So when we think about the ancient world, we have to think about a world that has none of these devices. And getting messages across was significantly difficult. Now, the, the classical city had devolved effectively three ways of building national consciousness. One is through public, public ceremony. So festivals like the Greater Dionysia performed here in the, uh, in the Theatre of Dionysus in Athens. More important, perhaps oratory performed in every ancient city we know of. Um, the skills of oratory, which uh, can bring together everybody you can hear. But even the largest crowds only never exceeded a few thousand. So the, vo no, the, the unamplified voice of an orator is limited by the capacity of auditoria and by the acoustics of auditoria. And we can set alongside this, I suppose, monuments as well, like, like the mausoleum of Augustus. But none of these, of course, are really going to allow the communication to a population like the size of the Roman Empire. So there's a huge difficulty facing uh, all early empires, but particularly the Roman Empire. And how do you get a message across to all those people at its peak, the Roman Empire maybe had 80 million people in it. How do you communicate to them without the resources of the Third Reich um, or Soviet Russia um, or modern internet powered um, superpowers are able to use? Now, we can see in the reign of Augustus some of the ways he got the message across. Uh, the, this particular message is the message that he had recovered from the Persian emperors, some of the military standards captured in the previous generation from the Roman general Crassus. And the surrender of the, the return of the Roman standards to Augustus was represented as a huge propaganda cue that 
it was also quite useful in terms of mili military and economic purposes to close down war on one front, which allowed Augustus to concentrate on campaigning in other areas to the north and south of the Mediterranean. So how do you communicate this? Well, one is through iconography, and you see on the breastplate of the um, Prima Porta statue of Augustus, you can see a Parthian holding a, a, a Roman standard, there's the eagle on top, and handing it back, here is Augustus, and he's receiving it, so thank you for my standard back. Um, but the power of this to communicate to people is limited to the number of people who get close to an image of the Prima Porta Augustus. Um, the original or any copies of it that existed. So it's really limited to dozens of people, maybe hundreds. Now, Augustus also builds a great arch, which no longer survives in the forum, a Parthian arch, which again is visible to anybody who wanders through the city of Rome. Maybe a million people lived in Rome by that time, and there were visitors from other, from other Italian cities and um, em embassies and visitors like Strobo from elsewhere. So if they wandered through the Forum and had a knowledgeable guide, they would see the Parthian arch here. Um, and here you see Augustus, uh, you see the riding a four-horse chariot for victory, and there you see um, palms of victory being held out by... Um, uh, by goddesses of victory, perhaps holding out the standards as well, it's not quite clear. And if you could read Latin and knew the, uh, knew the standard abbreviation, knew that tripot means tribunicia potestas, you could get some sense of the coin, which would also circulate a bit more widely. But these are huge limitations. How do you get a message beyond the Roman citizens, people in the city of Rome, people who might end up with a coin? But of course, if a coin like this end up in a distant province or in the hand of somebody whose native language is Syriac um, or Aramaic um, or Greek or Egyptian, what will they make of this? Will they see anything other than a picture of an arch with a chariot on it and perhaps a familiar face and then some writing and abbreviation they don't understand? So one of the problems that Augustus faces is how to get a message out, how to, how to manage this propaganda beyond the crowd you can hear a speech, beyond the population you can visit a monumentalized city, and beyond those you can understand, even really simple messages here, like this, on account of having saved citizens. And then for Romans who know about Roman imagery, uh, the crown of oak leaves that is given traditionally as a, as a sign of honor to somebody who has saved the life of a Roman citizen. Here, his name, Augustus, and his face. Now, the, the raised guest diet is part of an experiment, and I'm going to argue a failed experiment at mass communication. It's one of a series of documents issued in the early years of the Emperor Tiberius, um, which are not only produced at great length, but there are also copies of them appear in the provinces. And we have several others, which I won't be able to talk about in detail, but one, two of them in particular from AD 90, so five years after the death of Augustus, are generated around the, the death of the imperial prince Germanicus. Firstly, a set of honours for him, and we have fra fragments of this inscription copied out in, from documents in Spain and in Italy, various cities, put up copies of the honours voted by the Senate to Germanicus after his death, arches, statues, uh, commemorating Syria where he died and in other ends of the empire and the city of Rome as well. And then also a long and fairly recent decree, recently discovered decree of the Senate after the conviction of the governor of Syria, Piso, for killing Germanicus. And um, we have a huge verse of this text from Spain, but news fragments have popped up from the Roman province of Germany, from Geneva, and maybe they did extend more widely. And we think they did, because if you look at this inscription on the death of, of Piso, we'll see the fight near the, near the end of it. The Senate votes alongside all the honours to the various people who've come on board and signed up alongside Tiberius Caesar and his mother, Livia, the, the Augusta. They also say not, not only will our decree be inscribed in bronze and set up, it should be set up in the most popular city of every province and in the most frequented place in that city, so maybe the forum, the grand forum, the agora of each city, and should also be set up in the winter quarters of every legion where the standards are kept. So these are, op 
So these are like provincial capitals in a way. So 30 odd provincial capitals, you know, 30 odd um, Roman legions, a bit less, so between 50 and 60 copies of this decree to be set up in bronze for everyone to read if they wanted to. And the Senate, so this is a sign of this attempt, like with the dissemination of the raised gesto, which we don't know that Augustus himself wanted circulated internationally, an attempt to get the message across to the provincials, like Putin's message on the bulletin board, an attempt to get his version of the history of the Russian people since the ancient Rus available to everybody who might possibly read it. Well, could they read it? Most people who work on ancient literacy think it's unlikely that more than maybe five, ten percent could read complicated documents. There were maybe many more could probably read short notes or in or, um, in or the stamps pressed on amphorae um, or perhaps even things on coins. Here we have a wall painting from Pompeii, which is thought to show um, people reading and notice this has been put up in front of three statues. So perhaps people in Pompeii did come up and read a temporary notice put up. We know that temporary notices were put up on whiteboards or titulae picti. And here you have um, a detail of the Greek version of the text from, uh, from Ankara of the Reis Gestae. And you can form your own judgment about here how easy it would be to read. The, the Greek cities the East do have quite a tradition of some very long inscriptions. And you can see it's spaced out in such a way that maybe you could read it. Oops, sorry, anticipate that a bit. Um, and so it's possible people could read it, but we shouldn't really imagine this is getting to anything like all those people who could read daily newspapers in the 18th and 19th centuries, let alone those who could hear the radio or the, or the television in the 20th, or were given these textbooks in school in the 20th and 21st centuries. What does the text say? That's a long inscription, I can't go through all of it, but I want to give you a flavour of it. So I want to give you a flavour of Augustus's own words. So here is how it begins. At the age of 19, on my own initiative and at my own expense, I raised an army by means of which I restored liberty to the Republic, which had been oppressed by the tyranny of a faction. And in that first sentence, you see some themes will go through all of this long inscription. The big thing is the first person singular. It's all about me. It's all about what I did, my initiative, my expense, my army. I did this. Augustus, although he admits he has colleagues occasionally in the offices, puts himself right at the center of this inscription. This is an inscription about one man. It's completely idiosyncratic. It's completely egotistical. And this I think is true of what most dictators do. And if we had burrowed into Mussolini's architecture in Rome or Hitler's classicism uh, or indeed Putin's Russia, that single individual no longer supported by a party or democracy, no longer part of a team. This is the absolute fingerprint of autocracy in every age. I did this at my expense. And this is why Augustus has often been compared to fascist dictators. Um, by Powell Zanka, by Ronald Sine, by many others. For which service the Senate with complimentary resolutions enrolled me in the order in the consulship, giving me the same time consular precedence in voting. And here we see a second feature of the raised gestae, something highly selective. Augustus raises an army and more or less blackmails the Senate into giving him the role of a consul, even though he's not been elected a consul like Pansa and Hirtius, who conveniently die shortly afterwards. Um, and although the Senate in theory gives him orders, in practice, the orders are ones that he commanded the Senate to give him. So here we see Augustus claiming the legitimate support of, of the traditional political bodies, um, but in ways uh, that we know and later historians of Rome recorded, Roman historians recorded, uh, was a sham. So a highly selective version of events. In the same year, both consuls having fallen in war, the people elect me consul and a triumvir for setting the constitution. This is the only point at which Augustus admits that he was originally one of three people, him, Augustus, him, Augustus's deputy, 
Lepidus and his master of horse Antony together were set up to organize the state. But Augustus, by the way he tells it, it's always just him. I was elected a triumvir, and he doesn't, Lepidus and Antony don't feature in this inscription. Those who slew my father, I drove into exile. I punished their deed by due process of law. When they waged war upon the Republic, I twice defeated them in battle. Here we can do some fact checking in the manner of decent um, journalists today. Who slew him? his father, Brutus and Cassius, and who chased them down? Well, Mark Antony, along with Augustus, the two of them campaigned against Brutus and Cassius. No mention here of Antony. Antony is going to perish at Actium, but again, that won't be signalled. After, through due process of law, well, there's not, due process of law is whatever law you pass. One of the laws that, the, that Antony and Octavian and Lepidus passed was a law that allowed them to list people who could be killed with impunity and their property confiscated by the state. This included some of their own relatives and also Cicero. Cicero is hunted down, killed without trial, his hands and his head are cut off and displayed in the forum on the rostrum. The head the hands because they'd written speeches that condemned Antony, the head because it was from his lips that he had spoken all those speeches. So this is oratory silenced, the end of political oratory in the Roman state. After this, virtually all Roman orations will be speeches of praise, and the object of those speeches of praise will be emperors. And as for the war, it doesn't mention that Octavian was sick in his tent, and couldn't take part in the battles of Philippi. He's much criticised later. He was accused, he claimed he was ill, and then later claimed he had a vision asking that he should leave um, the battlefield. He doesn't mention any of this. By the time of his death, he simply wants people to remember his pietas, his pious vengeance, worked on the killers of his father. And then chapter three, wars, civil and foreign, I undertook throughout the world on land and sea. When victorious, I spared all citizens who sued for pardon. Well, that was after the prescriptions. Foreign nations that could be pardoned, I preferred to save. And then we begin something else that is a theme throughout the raised guest day, constant facts. How many people, how much money? 500,000 people swore an oath to me. 300,000 got were settled in colonies. I captured 600 ships. And throughout the race, guess I we get total after total. I spent this much on the games. I put these number of citizens. Um, these are the number, this amount of money I gave for the corn supply. Well, alongside this, and I'm not going to fact check every th one of 35 chapters, I promise. But I'll point out he actually was remembered his, for his brutality towards his enemies his lack of clemency compared to his adopted father, Caesar. But again, he doesn't mention the other trade theory. And yet again, he mentions, he, he, he spins this so that this is all about him as the victor and making peace. It's not him about the aggressor, not about killing people, it's about settling people. Now, it's not all lies. And this is, of course, part of the power of good propaganda. Obvious lies are easy to refute, but it's more difficult to pick out the omissions, the selective works. And this is what I thought reading um, Putin's 5,000 word essay. It's not so much what he says, it's what he doesn't say. It's not so much the interpretation he gives, it's that he doesn't talk about other interpretations. And so it's true that the Roman Empire is extended enormously within Augustus' reign, that he conquers he settles Gaul, he conquers out to the Rhine, he conquers up to the Danube, he, he finishes the conquest of Spain. Rome now does rule from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. Egypt is absorbed into the Roman Empire. Um, there are campaigns in Arabia, there are campaigns in Nubia, that's the modern um, uh, Sudan. Um, there are other campaigns, there's, there's wars out into um, Syria, areas that don't become conquered. So that's true, and it does indeed settle people and you can see from the right all the colonies he settles and so this is and what he doesn't do of course is say he does this in order to reduce the military bill because his his empire is dangerously militarized and way over budget 
but it's true he creates colonies and scatters them throughout the Mediterranean. He doesn't mention the confiscations of land from people in order to give land to the colonists. And at the end of the inscription, um, he mentions, he claims his legitimacy again. After I'd extinguished civil wars, when by universal consent I was in complete control of affairs, which meant really, of course, that he'd hunted down and killed all his enemies, I gave the, the I transferred to the Republic my power. So he claims that he handed over power to the Senate and people of Rome. Now we know, and every reader of this inscription knew that this had been theatre, political theatre, that he'd claimed to step down, and then he, and then they had they had again at his wishes asked him to stay on, and he'd agreed to remain in control but as a private citizen he gets a new name augustus he gets all sorts of honors all of these honors are true but what but what this covers over is the reality that from actum on we have dictatorship there is no other decision making the senate never debates things without knowing what the answer is already power has in the words of the historian keith hopkins been palatialized been drawn out of the public sphere into the palace um, and we see now a long re reiteration of honours. Um, the Senate and the people of the Rome gave him all this. All this time I excelled in my influence, but I had no more power than anyone else. This is a lie, but it's a lie that's impossible to refute in AD 14. And then, all, then he, his, the crowning thing is given the title of father of my country. This is, of course, a title others have had before, including murdered Cicero. And... Uh, agreed it should be, and he writes down, I am writing this in my 76th year, and we imagine that different versions of the raised guest I have been updated at regular intervals, because Augustus couldn't know how long he would live. And here is uh, a version of that shield of virtues, uh, which dedicated by the scent, in this case, it's a copy from Arles, so again, disseminate the provinces, a version of a Roman honour of the Senate and the people of Rome, giving to em Emperor Caesar Augustus, um, and already he's the son of um, the deified Julius, and then here are the, the shield of virtue, and here his virtues, mercy, justice, and piety towards the gods and his country. Now, clemency, mercy, not so much if you're one of the prescripti. Justice, but he's rigged the justice system. Piety, this is the piety of the avenger. Um, piety towards the gods and towards his homeland. So, how's the rest of the inscription structured? I'll have to be quick. Um, he gave it we go through, first of all, his power, his military success, then his honours, uh, then his role restoring the state and this takes us up to the moment where he closes the door to the temple of Janus and declares war is over. The Augustus in the second half of his reign is all about peace at home and war abroad. His honours, his building projects, games, again usually all of the you know, vast amounts detailed of how much he spent, how much on tribes, then the wars of conquest, uh, the embassies coming from distant parts from India, the Parthians, and then the closing words, which I've already given you. And he did indeed cover the city of Rome with monuments. Um, this is an extremely good site to give um, digital Augustan Rome, which you can track down, um, detailed accounts of all the monuments he built and repaired. You'll see here um, the Circus Maximus, um, here are all the buildings in the Forum, uh, the Theatre of Marcellus, um, here is the original site of, there's the Pantheon, there's the original site of the Arapakis and so on. So, my ending question then is who is convinced? Now, one of the things that the internet does is it allows you to tell everything, to tell the entire world your version. And this is what Vladimir Putin did on the 12th of July, 2021. But one of the other things the internet does, it allows people to talk back quickly. And so within two days, Professor Georgi Kasyanov of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences published a detailed refutation. And then the following day, um, the US-based editor of Ukraine Alert published another essay. And these for, for the Atlantic Council, a US-based think tank. 
And these versions then feed into mass media like the BBC. And so this essay that Putin puts up is now mostly an exhibit of his own extraordinary view on the world. So what was meant presumably to convince people of the unity of the children of the Russias simply convicts him as a selective um, and mendacious um, historian. The internet, in other words, takes what the internet gives. What about in antiquity? Was ancient propaganda any more successful? Well, we have some images and we, see, we have some signs of how people attempted to present this. And they're already Tiberian. The, the monument on which at Apollonia, on which the inscript, the raised gesto is inscribed, has on it statues, a big one of Augustus, then one of Tiberius, then one of Augustus's widow, Augusta, Tiberius's mother, Livia, Julia Augusta, and then of Germanicus and Drusus, who at this time was still going to be the next generation of, after Tiberius. So we see it's a Tiberian monument. And so, and this is also true of the Gemma Augustea, uh, where we see Augustus. Um, this met, some people think it's made before Augustus's death. Um, some people think it's much more about Tiberius' succession and Augustus' ascension to heaven. There's the Capricorn, um, various gods and goddesses. And there's some debate about who, who all these represent. But the iconography, captured barbarians, triumphs, and so on, victory chariots, this all comes through, or probably, in my view, probably Rome, Augustus being crowned here. This is all about the same messages of um, the raised guest. Do you notice they they found space for the eagle here underneath the chair, though that seems particularly bizarre to me. The eagle's going to sit underneath his throne. But did people believe it? Well, not according to uh, Tacitus, who in his account of the funeral of Augustus presents two versions, what people thought about him. Some people, says Augustus, praised him. He was feeling, he was dutiful, the need to his country. Uh, he couldn't do other than deal with civil strife. Um, he put up with a lot of bad things in Antony and bad things in Lepidus, just in order to revenge Julius Caesar. And the only remedy for the country was governed by one man. This idea of a remedy harks back to that, the way the historian Livy wrote about how now we've got you know, Augustus reign to a time where we can neither endure our illness nor put up with the remedies for them. The empire fenced by the ocean distant rivers. So this is the positive version. So as you read through Tacitus, you think, oh, well, maybe everyone was convinced by the race gesture, by the Tiberian message. Except what follows is a much longer negative version. Others said filial duty in the position of the state to be merely a cloak. It had been a ruse. Come to fact, it was lust for domination. Um, he subdued the legions of a consul. He pretended to be on the common pan side, then following him to usurpation. So as you read through it, you'll see claims he murdered those two consuls. It mentions the prescriptions of, of the citizens, the death of citizens. This is, this is Sextus Pompey. All the murders, um, all the betrayals. Yes, there had been peace, but peace with bloodshed. And this had led not so much to victories, but to military disasters, military disasters in Germany, the army of Lolius, the army of Varus, where just five years before Augustus' death, three legions had been wiped out, the execution at Rome of, of noble figures. It's domestic, and then it goes on to attack um, all of the, all the scandals around his marriage, the scandals around his children, um, and even the, uh, the allegation that he had chosen Tiberius to succeed him because he knew Tiberius would be such a terrible emperor, people would remember Augustus fondly in retrospect. This is played out in other media. Early in Tiberius' reign, uh, we see a historian who had produced a critical account of the reign of Augustus, Cremudius Cordus, is compelled to commit suicide. He's tried in the Senate for disloyalty, for myostas. Tacitus again tells the story of his final speech in which he says, future generations will give everyone their honor. Even as I'm condemned, people will remember Cassius Brutus, the tyrannicides. They may even remember me myself. 
and then he left the Senate and starved himself to death as commanded. The Senate, writes Tacitus, decreed the, the ideal should burn his books, but they survived, hidden and then republished. So we can still read them today. And Tacitus concludes, one is more inclined to laugh at the foolishness of those who imagine that today's regime can extinguish the way they'll be remembered by subsequent generations. One is more declined to laugh at their foolishness. Thank you very much for your attention.